Okay, we're gonna get started. It is one o'clock. <laughs> Thank you everyone for being here. I'm Kathy Lancaster with the Library of Michigan and I'm very happy to have Pamela Martin Diaz here with us today for Story Times for Everyone. Uh, this is a ready to read Michigan training. Uh, brought to you by the Institute of Museum and Library Services and the Library of Michigan. Pamela has uh, an introduction today, but I can tell you I've, I've just gotten to know Pamela in the last couple months and she's a delight and I'm really happy to have her here in Michigan. So Pamela, I'm gonna pass the mic over to you. Oh, and we gotta unmute you. <laughs> Okay, great. So I'm seeing you uh, mostly. As, are you? As, am I supposed to be bigger on the screen? I can spotlight you here today. Okay. There and we go. Thank change you. the view. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you so much. Well, welcome everybody to Story Times for Everyone. I'm delighted to be here with you um, this afternoon. Uh, I really do appreciate the time that you're taking out of your, your regularly scheduled day um, to be here now um, to learn about story times for everyone. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, so let's see, here we go. Where's my screen? Here we are. And my slideshow. There we go. Story times for everyone supporting adults as partners in developing young children's language and literacy. So the first order of business, of course, is to look at the agenda. Um, the first part of as introduction, project background about every child ready to read, early literacy, language development, the power of talk, Becoming a Successful Reader, and Dialogic Reading and Picture Walk. You'll have the opportunity to practice dialogic reading. But first, in terms of introductions, unfortunately, because of the constraints around time, I'm not able for all of you to introduce yourselves to me or to tell me what, you know, what kind of work you're doing or anything about your libraries. I know from talking with Kathy that there's a wide um, variety of levels of experience um, among you. Some of you are just starting out and others of you have been <clears throat> doing library work excuse me, for quite a long time. So hopefully, regardless of where you are in the, in the um, arc of librarianship, library work with children, that you will um, find some information that you find um, that will be helpful and interesting for you. So again, my name is Pamela Martin Diaz, and um, my early literacy work has become informed by my commitment to improve educational outcomes for children. And I have come <clears throat> to learn and I fully embrace the idea that is only by influencing and inspiring the behavior of the adults in young children's lives that educational outcomes can, can be um, improved. So the research supporting every child ready to read which is the research that this presentation is built upon, completely changed my relationship with story time and with actually with a, adult care providers. Um, and it literally breathed a new life and purpose into my work. That sounds probably a little corny or overly dramatic, um, but it's true. Um, you know, we know how to do story time, right? We know what to do, how to do, and, and all the things involved. But what's so powerful about the information that I've learned through Every Child Ready to Read is the research base that has given me the why. Why do we do what we do? Why have we been doing um, nursery rhymes for, for centuries? Um, and once finding out the why for me has been um, a, you know, a revelation and a real 
um, inspiration. So I left my position with Allen County Public Library in Fort Wayne, Indiana, a few years ago, um, retiring from my day-to-day -day job as a branch manager and early literacy coordinator. I'm currently working on a project in rural Ohio, Knox County, Ohio, um, with uh, a Head Start there to help Head Start teachers and adults use the books that their children receive every month in the mail through Dolly Parton's Imagination Library. So I've been able to, um, to keep doing story times with infants, toddlers, and um, preschoolers, as well as developing um, training for the Head Start teachers on early literacy and learning. So a little bit of background information about every child ready to read. So you may know that there's there's been a couple of um, like iterations of this program. The first one came out, I think it was in like 2004, and then it was redone in um, 2011. But regardless if it's the first edition or the second edition that, that we were referring to, um, there are some basic tenets that have not changed. And these are what they are. That reading is an essential life skill. Learning to read begins at birth. Parents and caregivers are their children's first and most important teachers. Lifelong learning is a primary role of public libraries, and this is a parent education initiative. Well, as you can imagine, there wasn't a lot of controversy around the first four of these, right? Seems like, yeah, this is, you know, it's what libraries are, it's what library workers do. The parent education piece for some people has been a little bit difficult to get their brains around. Um, thoughts like, you know, well, I'm a children's librarian. I don't really do parent education. Um, so, but what we have, um, what's been developed over time are workshops from Every Child Ready to Read and the methodology that we're using um, now in story time to educate parents in the context of what they're doing already with their children. So it's not us as teachers of reading. We're not teaching reading. We're not um, doing anything like that. We're helping parents lay the foundation upon which a child who reads with understanding is built. And the early part of early literacy is really important and interesting. So we can see here um, the brain's ability to to change in response to experiences is very high when children, when the brain is young. So here, this is in years. Unfortunately, as we get older, the amount of effort required um, to affect change goes way up and what's actually changed diminishes greatly. So early is key in all of this. We know that parents are their children's first teachers. They're with them from the earliest years, right? But they don't really know about brain development in children under the age of three. So look at these numbers. Basically, 11% know a lot and everybody else knows nothing or a little bit. So how can we expect parents to do the kinds of things that help children with brain development if they don't even know what it is? Pediatricians are pressed for time and often don't share this information with adults or, or care providers um, when the opportunity arises. This is where we come in. We are information specialists, right? This is what we do. So we can share the information that we learn through our own research of research, through workshops we attend, articles and books that we read. And we can share it with them when we interact with them uh, on a daily basis, like when they're looking for books or checking books out or what have you. And also through story time, which is what we're going to be doing, um, learning more about um, this week and then the following two weeks where we really dive deeply into that. We can also provide them with a place where they can get support. Support 
in their information sharing needs, right? But also support that they can get from a community of parents. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen some beautiful friendships that have been established through story time. Um, friendships that adults have formed, as well as the children that they are with. There are not many places where, where parents and children can go to meet people of similar ages and interests. The library provides that. Now, granted, at this point in time and in the last year and a half, it's been extraordinarily difficult. I don't know what story time is going to look like when everybody is able to come back. It's going to be different. It's going to require a lot of patience on everyone's part because we have we will have children that have basically haven't been with other children for their entire lives. Think of your basic 18 or 20 month year old. Um, it's going to be very interesting. Um, um, but but you know, we can do it. Um, you got through COVID okay, keeping your, you know, sense of perspective and, and all that going. Welcoming, welcoming them back will be awesome and it will be very interesting. So before we go any farther, what exactly is early literacy? Well, it's what children know about communication, language, both verbal and nonverbal, um, reading and writing before or they can actually read or write. It involves all of their experiences with conversation, stories that they've heard, um, written in oral language, books, and print. Early literacy, again, it's the foundation upon which a child who reads with understanding is built. It's the very, the very like basics of being able to learn how to read. And these are the components of early literacy. Today, we're going to be looking most deeply at oral language because it's the foundation of the foundation, so to speak. There's also phonological awareness, the ability to hear and play with the smaller sounds and words, print conventions and awareness, knowing that print is everywhere um, and has meaning, letter knowledge, knowing that letters look different from one another and represent a sound, Background knowledge is what um, children learn either by being taught or through life experiences. And print motivation, the desire, the impetus to want to learn how to read is part of that. And then um, vocabulary, which is knowing the names of things. So, and the five practices. So this is a big, a big switch from early literacy first edition, where we talked about what we just saw, the um, five component, the components. So when they did the evaluation of every child ready to read one, they realized, you know, some people, some library staff, some parents were not comfortable with terms like phonological awareness and comprehension skills and all these things. And there was a realization that parents need to feel and be empowered to help their children develop early literacy skills. And in fact, they already are doing things, which we call practices that help their children develop language and literacy. And those practices are talk, read, write, sing and play. And then I add everywhere, every day, because that makes a nice little rhyme. So <laughs> this is what we kind of combine them together in our story times. Okay, so we have story times and early literacy. What we're moving toward through the, um, through the course of, of these sessions is what we call early literacy enhanced story times, wherein we acknowledge to the adults we're in story time, we point it out and we model story time, we model early literacy behaviors so that the adults can see how they can do similar things with their own children to help those children get ready to learn how to read. So the goal of this in the end is that, that we'll all be comfortable with doing early literacy enhanced story times. And some of the things that we learn about in the um, through doing story times, the research base, 
we're going to be talking about how to interject um, early literacy information in conversations that we might have with people as we see them or come upon them in the library during the day. Because you know we have lots of opportunities to be um, to be interactive in story time and of course just in the library in general. We want adults to see the connection between the activities and later learning. This is because the adult is with the child um, throughout the day and can take advantage of those teachable moments. We can take, of, take advantage of teachable moments in more formal ways. When we have interactivity between us and children, um, the adults and children, we can encourage um, behaviors and activities between children and children, us and children, you get the idea, lots of opportunities to interact with people. And we have lots of ways to do it. We're going to be exploring this in, much, in, in quite a bit of depth in the next two sessions. So this is like a little preview into the direction that we're going. But before we can even talk anymore about early literacy, we have to look at the fact that language is the key to literacy, learning, and social emotional development. So we're going to take a quick view, um, a quick look at this um, video from the Harvard Center on the Developing Child. And it gives a good explanation of what's going on in the brain in terms of language and literacy. So here we go. The key to forming strong brain architecture is what's known as serve and return interaction with adults. In this developmental game, new neural connections form in the brain as young children instinctively serve through babbling facial expressions and gestures and adults return the serve, responding in a very directed, meaningful way. It starts very early in life, when a baby coos and the adult interacts and directs the baby's attention to a face or hand. This interaction forms the foundation of brain architecture upon which all future development will be built. It helps create neural connections between all the different areas of the brain, building the emotional and cognitive skills children need in life. For example, Here's how it works for literacy and language skills. When the baby sees an object, the adult says its name. This makes connections in the baby's brain between particular sounds and their corresponding objects. Later, adults show young children that those objects and sounds can also be represented by marks on a page. With continued support from adults, children then learn how to decipher writing and eventually to write themselves. Each stage builds on what came before. Ensuring that children have adult caregivers who consistently engage in serve and return interaction, beginning in infancy, builds the foundation in the brain for all the learning, behavior, and health that follow. Oops. So, there you have it. Um, what's happening in the brain when adults um, are doing what's called serve and return. And I wanted to introduce this pretty early on because I refer to it throughout this presentation. It's a very fundamental way in which children develop their oral language, which of course is the basis for all later literacy. Oral language is a development of knowledge and skills that allow children to understand, speak, and use words to, to communicate. And it has um, three different um, components. The first, of course, is listening skills. It's literally um, the ability to hear the, the, what other people are saying when they speak. Um, it's hearing and manipulating the smaller sounds and words. And children acquire um, listening skills by being read to and um, by doing things like, look at this little person here. 
So someone probably said said this this little person's name. Like let's say let's say their name is Adrian, and someone just said Adrian. So Adrian is looking because Adrian has learned that whatever language comes after their name, it it's directed at them, and the language that comes after are some of the words that the child will be learning through through um, using the name as an anchor. Now, speaking skills, of course, is the ability to produce the sounds of language. It's understanding what words mean and the connections among those words. It's putting words in the right order that we say, it's a, like a brown cow, not a cow brown, that it would be like in some other languages and using conventional forms of words. Um, and of course, communication skills are the understanding of the social rules of communication that we greet one another, we say hello, we say goodbye. We use communication um, to ask questions, to get information and to engage peers and adults in conversation. It's using words and, um, to communicate, to find information. And this, a lot of this can be accomplished with young children through this um, activity that's called joint attention. So for example, if you look at this, this baby right here, um, it's looking somewhere and it's probably because this, the eyes are automatically following an adult's eye. So when an adult is gazing at something, and when the adult looks away at something, um, the child automatically looks. And this is called joint attention. So research tells us that babies as young as 10 months of age depend on the adult's gaze and the adult's pointing gestures when learning language. And the ability to follow eye gaze has been found to be related to future language ability at 18 months of age. Babies that have better gaze following have higher language scores. We know that children learn in a social context. This child is not looking at the spoon, right? This child is looking at the face behind the spoon. So we know language is natural. And it's that give and take, the serve and return that you saw in that video that enables children to learn language. Oops, sorry, went too fast. So the fact that language is a social endeavor has led the um, American Academy of Pediatrics, well, along with a large body of research to make some some specific recommendations about the use of screens and young children. Um, for children under the 18, um, the mark of 18 months of age, they recommend that um, screens avoid, that they avoid screen use altogether, other, unless they're doing something like FaceTime or video chatting. Slightly older children, um, only high quality programs. And for children age two to, Five, limiting it to one hour a day of high quality programs. And all of these um, screen watching should be done co-viewing with an adult who can help them understand what they are seeing and apply it to the world around them. Now we know for um, preschoolers have learned and can learn from educational programming like Sesame Street Workshop and things like that. Um, this is going to be a very difficult thing for a lot of parents to deal with as um, young children have, some kids have attended preschool virtually and that they've been taught through screens. It's going to be a challenge, I'm guessing, for many people to lessen the amount of screen time that their children are um, experiencing. So this video is called the still face experiment. It shows us what happens to a baby um, when there's when the baby's being paid attention to and where that attention, that joint attention is broken. Babies this young are extremely responsive 
to the emotions and the reactivity and the social interaction that they get from the world around them. This is something that we started studying oh, 34 years ago when people didn't think that infants could engage in social interaction. In this still phase experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. I like a girl. Oh. And she gives a greeting to the baby. The baby gives a greeting back to her. Yeah. Yeah. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this. And then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. Yeah. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, come on, why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction, they react with negative emotions, they turn away, they feel the stress of it, they actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. It's a little like the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is that normal stuff that goes on that we all do with our kids. The bad is when something bad happens, but the infant can overcome it. After all, when you stop the still face, the mother and the baby start to play again. The ugly is when you don't give the child any chance to get back to the good. There's no reparation and they're stuck in that really ugly situation. So, um... I know the first time I saw that, I just wanted to jump through the screen and pick that baby up, but it's a really powerful um, example of how just critically important that serve and return, that social connection is. And did you notice the, um, how the mom was talking to the baby? Well, that particular kind of speech is called parentese. It's that high pitch, elongated vowels, we speak very slowly and we use parentese when we're talking to kittens and puppies and babies. And um, what's so interesting, there's some new research on coaching that I came upon um, recently. And um, this is from the University of Washington. And they found that parents who participated in individual coaching sessions used parentees more often than control group parents who were not coached and that coaching produced more parent-child conversational turns. So, quote, we now think parentees works because it's a social hook for the baby brain. It's high pitch and slower tempo are socially engaging and invite the baby to respond, end quote. So the children of coached parents produced uh, more words, but at twice the frequency of children whose parents were in the control group. Um, and what, one of the things that I really appreciate about this is the fact that coaching works. So this is a strategy that um, if we get invited to go to like a new parent group or something like that, to do a whole presentation on serve and return and parentees and using some of the strategies we're going to be looking at soon <clears throat> but on how to talk um, with babies and um, children. <clears throat> so what about our multilingual families? 
Is there anything different um, about how they have, about how those children um, learn language? Well, we do know from research that children should learn the language that their parents know best. And this is because they'll have a richer language experience when they're spoken to using um, their home language. And that as libraries, you know, we offer support for people who um, speak and read in languages, <clears throat> excuse me, other than English. I um, mean, there is an advantage to being multilingual because of the fact that there's a lot of code switching going on and the effort that it takes to constantly um, manage the switching of languages, um, multilingual or bilingual people have more cognitive flexibility and higher executive function because we know from research that parts of the, um, the brain that aren't used a lot get pruned and that making um, the brain more efficient. So children are born knowing all, well, not knowing, having the ability to hear all the sounds in, in the world of all the languages. But as they get older, that window, that wide open window of language um, closes and they can only hear then the sounds from the language that, they, that they've become accustomed to. And this explains why some of us have such a difficult time um, speaking in a language um, that's, that's a, a new language to us, especially if it has sounds in it that are not shared by our, our own language. Um, another, um, this is just so interesting. So I'm going to share this on how children turn um, into, language into speech sounds. Thanks again, Warren, for coming in. We really appreciate it. Bigger. Psychologist Dr. Janet Worker wants to know how babies learn to distinguish speech sounds of their native language. Babies, just like adults, are interested in new information. So when they hear something that's different from what they've been hearing before, their interest perks up. And you can measure that in a number of ways. You can measure it through their sucking pattern or through their looking time, or even through something like a head turn. Worker trains babies to turn their heads whenever they hear a change in sound by rewarding them with a view of a musical bunny. Soon, babies are turning their heads the moment they hear a change, anticipating the bunny. Headphones prevent the adults from hearing the speech sounds and accidentally cueing the baby. Hey Shane, are you ready? Worker can now find out if this six-month-old can hear the difference between two English sounds. She keeps the baby engaged until phonemes are played over a speaker. Da. 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 Ba. This baby can hear the difference between B and D. In fact, even newborns can tell them apart. Look, Shane, look. Next, worker tests the baby with another pair of sounds. The phoneme will change from one kind of D to another. The two sound distinct to speakers of Hindi, but adults who only speak English can't hear the difference. Uh, 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 uh. The baby hears the difference between the two sounds, one of which she's never heard before. By the age of 10 to 12 months, infants not regularly exposed to Hindi lose the ability to distinguish these sounds. Uh, 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 uh. 12 month old babies have already become specialists in their native language. We now know that even in very young children, the ability to hear language is highly developed. For parents of future readers, workers' research contains an important message. As a parent, when you're talking to your infant, you're not only having a wonderful time and setting up a great emotional relationship, but you might also be providing them with essential information for them to become accomplished readers some several years later. So it's all just so interesting, all this research. I love how they um, they do this by using the, like, you know, the, the little, um, what do you call it? The wind thingy and the clown and all the things. It's just so interesting. So 
So we know, we can see here how language takes off as children get older. Now, we know also that there's a lot of language going on here. It's mostly receptive language as children hear a lot of words, but to be able to pronounce words to speak actually comes a bit later. So this is from a seminal study done by Betty Hart and Ted, um, Todd Risley. And the book that came out of this is called Meaningful Differences in the Everyday Experience of Young American Children. So what they did was they went into homes and they kept track of the words that adults spoke to children and then later counting the words as children learned to speak. They divided families up into different socioeconomic groups. Um, this was lower socioeconomic, middle, and then more affluent um, families here. So you can see how everyone learned how to talk. They all acquired you know, words, but then there's this divide that started to happen. And you can see this a bit among the different groups. So the lower um, economic group um, parents spoke about 15 million words that, that the children heard, and then 30 million for the middle income, and then 50 million for um, higher income still. So um, it does make a difference how many words um, one hears, um, but of course it's the quality of speech we know that really makes a difference. And we're going to look at that in more detail in a moment. So I attended a virtual conference done by the Dollywood Foundation where I became familiar with some of the research by Dr. John Hutton. And he, he brought this up that it's not just um, a, a gap in the number of words that children hear, but it's also the lack of nurturing experiences and the kind of bonding with babies through books. Um, it's a relational gap, a gap in um, relational health and well being for children. So, from that, I also learned a really a really about a really interesting study that was done in um, Columbus Metropolitan Library. So for any of you that are doing a thousand books before kindergarten, um, some of these um, numbers are just, it's just amazing. So there's an estimated number of, of, of words that are heard by this kind of book sharing that I'm going to share with you. So what they did was they took the um, like 200 most um, highly circulating books for children from that library. And they took um, 30 books from uh, 30 board books and 30 picture books and they counted the average number of words. And then they extrapolated by how often um, children were read to. They figured that even um, children who were not read to a lot, probably, I mean, probably got a, someone read to them once every other month, let's say. And then if they're read to one or two times a week, um, this is how many words through the age of five that they would hear. And what's really interesting about this is that, um, well, for one thing, the number of words is, is stunning. It's not 30 million words, which is what the Hart and Risley kind of became this like phrase that was coined, the 30 million word gap. Um, but one and a half million words of, heard by children who are read to um, five books a day for five years. And think about your families, the ones that come in with a stack of picture books like this, the 30 picture books a week family, how many books do you think those kids um, are hearing every day? And we know the language is richer in picture books than it is in everyday speech. So, so they're not just getting more words. I mean, clearly, sitting around and saying dog, cat, dog, bird, fish, isn't going to move a child's language acquisition. It's the use of interesting and rich words that's going to make a difference. And a lot of those words appear in the books that we share with children. Pamela, yeah. uh, it's Kathy. We have a question in the chat. Um, if we allowed our children to watch kids shows in other languages, would the child pick up on that language still, even if the parents or caretakers did not speak it? No, you know, um, no, because they're not getting they're not getting the feedback. I mean, if that were true, 
I would watch like Chinese television all the time and I would be able to speak Chinese because I mean, you can see you can see why it wouldn't work, right? It's not you need feedback in order to acquire a language. Now, if you were watch, if you're a Spanish speaker, say, and you're watching a Spanish television show and you speak to your child in Spanish about the show, then you then 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 yeah, probably. But the child's actually learning Spanish from the adult that's sharing the um, the word, you know, the language with the child not from the screen. I wish it were true, really, because imagine we'd all know so many languages, you know, like when we could we could have watched Squid Games in Korean and then like it, that'd be so cool. Right. But no, <laughs> it doesn't yeah. work. <laughs> so it's about the interaction and it's all about the serve and return. That's it. That's the that's the piece, the piece Great. that counts. And there's so much research about. In fact, I read about um, there was a country, I think, I think it was in it's Switzerland or the Netherlands, uh, a European country, I'll just my geography, that was surrounded by um, speakers of lots of different languages. And they tried some of that watching television shows from the other languages and it didn't, it like, it didn't help. People were still speaking their own language. So, so, so what do you do, right? How can we help children learn more language? Well, Hart and Risley, who have been taken to task for some of the, the way that other people have portrayed their division among socioeconomics, because it doesn't matter how much money you have in the bank, it matters how much time you spend talking to your children in a face-to-face -face way that moves language, right? But Hart and Risley said, and other researchers time and time again since then, it's the play talk that makes the difference in language development. It's the chit chat, the conversation, singing, being silly, telling stories. It's like being present and having fun and talking. And it, it creates this upward spiral. Children that hear a lot of words get to practice a lot. They're learning more and more words and they're the confident you know, communicators. So what happens? Adults think, think this is just great. So they use richer language. And the children are learning more and more stories and are good storytellers. Other kids want to play with them because they're so much fun. So they get more opportunities to use their words. They ask their teachers and the adults in their lives sophisticated and interesting questions. They're getting more information. Their background knowledge is, is, is they're learning more and more. They're learning more words, more, more knowledge about how words and language work. They're learning words faster and faster and faster. In short, they become better readers. So adults, so when I say like adults or grownups, that, that's this kind of thing I would say um, like during story time is what we call an aside or a tidbit. So adults, children who know more words, children who have large vocabularies are better readers than children who know fewer words, okay? And so, but we need to remember something that the children who's, who's on the graph were down lower and then the medium and then the high, that everyone was still learning more words, right? But what happens is that gap did not close. Everybody's learning more words, but the children at the higher end of that curve are learning more words faster. And that is the beginning of the achievement gap. It is present before children step foot in a classroom or even a, a, a preschool classroom. Play talk is rich talk, okay? So for example, here's the difference. Um, let's say I'm just, um, okay, I'm the adult, I'm the parent. It's time to go get your shoes um, versus Hey, it's time to it's time to go. We need to find your shoes. Um, hmm. Do you remember what happened the last time we went outside? We didn't check the weather. Let's see how the weather is outside before we decide which shoes. Oh my gosh, it's raining, it's pouring, the old man is snoring. Hmm. What do you think? we should do. 
maybe we should wear our, what kind of shoes? Our, that's right, let's put on our boots. Because the last time we didn't, we came home and our feet were soaking wet. We had to wring our socks out. They were so wet. So you can see the difference. And you, you, I mean, here, I mean, yes, I exaggerated a little look for the sake of, you know, practice or what have you, but you've seen it, how adults talk like this at the library. You, you know, you've witnessed it and you know, like it's probably the families that are getting all the books that are talking to their children in interesting ways. So the more like modeling that we can do when we talk to children and grownups, um, it's not coaching, but it is modeling and it is showing a different way of interacting and communicating with children. There are lots of different acronyms, as you can well imagine, on how to talk interactively with children. I like the three T's and developed by um, Dana Suskin at the University of Chicago. And she has a project there called um, the 30 million word project. She advocates tune in, talk more and take turns. I like the three T's because um, it doesn't matter what order you do them in. You can talk more, you can tune in, or you can take turns. So I think it's just so much easier to remember than some of these really um, fancy acronyms. Her story is really interesting. She's actually a physician who um, implants cochlear implants in, in deaf children so that they can hear. So she and her colleagues noticed that some children were not learning how to talk in a way that they expected. Um, and the implants were working. So they, they, they looked at children and their, re, their interactions in the family and they realized that some children were not being spoken to enough for them to acquire sufficient language. So, and because of the correlation between um, lower socioeconomics and um, uh, fewer interactions, fewer exchanges, um, they have a program in Chicago where they're coaching parents on using um, serve and return um, more. So, and some new research um, out of, let's see, where's this, MIT, discovered that family conversations at home are associated with brain development in children. So it's not just language acquisition, okay? It's literal brain development. And it's, quote, almost magical how parental conversation appears to influence the biological growth of the brain. So they found that the number of conversational turns, the serve and return, with child, um, correlated strongly with children's scores on standardized tests of language skill. And they said, quote, such turn taking occurs more often in families from a higher socioeconomic status, but children coming from families with lesser income or parental education show the same benefits from conversational turn taking. That doesn't mean it's easy for less educated families under greater economic stress to have more conversation with their children. But at the same time, it's a targeted specific action and there may be ways to promote or encourage that. What I like about this is that it, it's like, it, there's no, it, there's no blame. It's, they're not blaming parents. We're looking, you know, from a strength-based point of view, parents want what's best for their children. And we can help by modeling um, kinds of interactions that we know can help children acquire more language. And so how do we do this? Well, we need to um, strive for five interactions and that's um, child, adult, adult, child, child, adult, adult, child. So in other words, we're not just talking at the child. We're not just shooting words at the child and hoping that something sinks in. No, we want to encourage that. I mean, look at this engagement. They are eye to eye, they are face to face. She is tuning in and I'm, I'm sure she's talking more. And look at the response she's getting from the child, okay? And also, we wanna wait five seconds for the child to be able to respond. So 
it might seem like five seconds, that's nothing. Well, if you do the one Mississippi, two Mississippi um, test, we'll see how long it takes. So if I said, hey, what's this? You're right, they're fingers. That's a long time. Like usually we're jumping all over the kids by now. We don't give them a chance to organize their brain. There's a lot going on up there. We need to enable, let's give them a chance, give them not a minute, just five seconds out of our lives for them to answer. So we're going to take um, a few minutes now and um, take a look at what this woman that we're going to be seeing in this um, very short film, which I'm going to show twice, could have done to encourage and support more language. So I'm going to play it twice. So pay attention because it's really, if you blink, you might miss it. It's really short. Um, and then um, Kathy's going to break, uh, break us up into rooms, I would say for about, um, I don't know, five minutes maybe. And then we can come back and see um, what kinds of things people discovered. It could be the, something about the way the woman talks, how the child interacts, um, what is she doing right? Anything about the, the bottle toy thing that they're using that could have been done differently. Whatever you can think of to think if this were you, what could you do differently to get more language um, from the child? Look at all the bubbles. Look, sparkles. Wow. Look at them. Chip, 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 chip. Rose. Wee. Rose. Like it. And I can chip, 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 chip. See ya. <laughs> See ya. Yeah, so um, let's see. I'm going to go back. And then forward and see it one more time. Look at all the bubbles. Look, sparkles. Wow. Look at them. Shake, 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 shake. Rose. Wee. Rose. That's it. And I can shake, 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 shake. See ya. <laughs> see ya. <laughs> So um, that's, um, so yeah, Kathy, um, you'll break us up into runes. Let's see what time is it. It's almost five of, so we'll come back and then um, talk for about another five minutes to see what people would like think could have been done differently, okay? All right, I'm gonna open up the rooms. Uh, Pamela, okay. you ignore your invitation there. <laughs> I'm gonna okay. pause the recording. I'm gonna go ahead and resume recording. All right, Pamela. Okay. Back to you. Welcome back, everybody. Yes, thank you. So um, does anyone have anything they'd like to, any suggestions for, for, for um, the woman in the shaky bottle? What did you see? Any, what did she do? Anything that she did well? Or what did she do that wasn't so great? Or anything? We discussed that there was, we felt like there was almost an overwhelming amount of stimulation, but not an opportunity for the baby to react. And so in the end, we almost wonder if the baby got bored with, well, you know, if I can't interact, that's why I was going to skedaddle or see it type of thing. So that was what we were talking about. Um, yeah, somebody said something on the baby's level when we were, we were also talking about rolling the bottle back and forth and not sitting, but actually laying on our, our, our bellies and, you know, having more of the level with the baby. So that was our thought process. Yeah. I thought I, the first, I thought, yeah, I don't blame her for, for, for crawling away. I mean, that was like kind of overwhelming, right? Did you see, what did you see in terms of, uh, there was a lot of serve. <laughs> and then I'll let the baby, let the baby touch the bottle. She wouldn't even, I mean, it's like, it's, it was almost like the mom was like, that's my bottle and I'll play with it, but you don't touch it. Okay. I, that's what I felt like. It was like the mom played with it the whole time and shook it and rolled it. But the baby, every time the baby went to reach for it, she grabbed it back away. And it was like, okay, let the baby have a chance to try to show you how she can shake it or roll it or do anything with it. 
poor baby was like, nope, my mom's ripping this away from me. It's her bottle. <laughs> and really, the bottle wasn't that special. <laughs> no, but mom didn't let her touch it at all. You know, it was like she kept grabbing it from her. Right. But at least, I mean, I give her credit. She was she was looking at her. You know? Right. We were face to face. That That was good. But in terms of like what she could have said about the bottle, she could have had a whole conversation about the colors. Look what right. happened. She yeah, like, she didn't she, ask any questions, like her things. So there was, right. the, she just, yeah. What could she have asked? What could she have said to, like, even, okay, so this, the baby, the child looked pretty young, so she might be, you know, pre verbal, but we know that even the young, that young, she would, she would maybe make a noise or do something. What could the mom have said to, like, get some kind of response other than, look, it shakes? Anything? Can we think of anything she could have said? Do you see the bubbles? Or she could have said, could you roll it? Can you try to roll it to mommy? Uh, roll it back to mommy. I mean, if, the, if she had sat up a little more, you know, like, or like she said, laid on her belly. Can you roll it to mommy? Things like that. Or yeah. do, you, do you like the bubbles? Right, right. Right. Look at the what? red bubbles. What else do you see? You know, and pointing things out and she could have talked, she could have put it up and, and had the child like, see what happens if you knock it down. I mean, it could have really been a toy. Instead, somebody it felt to me like somebody said, here's a bottle, here's a child. Now talk, you know, and so she did. And the, all she did was was talk. So we can see that the when there when there isn't the serve and return, that she didn't give the five seconds. I mean, I don't even think she gave two seconds, really, um, in terms of a lot, encouraging the child to use any language whatsoever. So um, yeah, it's a pretty brutal um, example of um, not letting the child talk, <laughs> but it gets the point across. And so, Pamela, lots mm -hmm. of great feedback in the chat too, oh, um, good. especially okay. with the question ideas, you know, what is that? Is that mm -hmm. a red bottle? Mm -hmm. um, oh, is that a red bottle? Yes or no? Okay, so remember, we haven't gotten to this part yet. We want to ask open ended questions. So it'd be more like, you know, what colors, what color is it? Now this child doesn't know colors, but go, oh, it's red. It's red like, you know, the stripe on the flag or, you know, whatever. But anyway, so I see it's just about the top of the hour. So I do like to give people a few minutes to take a quick little um, stretch break. Does that sound good? Um, to stand up and stretch, stretch yourselves out or go get a, a cup of something or do whatever you need to do. Um, Kathy, you think five minutes is good? That it, yeah. Yeah, let's come back here at 210. Okay. All right. All Thanks. right. Thank you, everybody. We'll be back in five minutes. And I'm going to share my screen again. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Welcome Thank back. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, next we're going to we, we've looked at language and language development and you've come to understand I think how important the um, serve and return um, interaction is between adults and children um, and now we're kind of we're going to take it kind of to the next step um, to, to take a look at the reading process and what do children need in order to become successful readers. So this part is, is taken directly from Every Child Ready to Read. If you have um, access to the Every Child Ready to Read manual, um, you do have the opportunity if you want to do a presentation using um, that from um, PLA and ALSC program, um, you can do that because you <laughs> as owners of the manual. When you see this little symbol here, that means that this is part of the Every Child Ready to Read um, program. And so in order to become successful readers, children need to learn a code, also called decoding. They need to understand the meaning of those words, which is also called comprehension. And they need to have fluency. They need to be able to read um, smoothly. We're gonna look at these things. So. Reading is learning the code. 
So you can't read the bracket or the asterisk or any of those symbols unless you know the code. Once you break the code, you can see that each symbol represents a letter and those re letters represent a sound. So you can then read, I can read. So let's say you're a beginning reader and you you're just starting out and you see these squiggles that really frankly don't mean anything at all. What, 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 what could this possibly be? And then somebody tells you when you understand that these are letters and they represent a sound and that when you put them together, you have a word. So, but at, but at, bat. And that is how you decode and learn how to read. So there are some of the components that we looked at in the beginning that lend themselves particularly to decoding. And these components are print awareness, which is knowing, noticing print in that print is everywhere and has meaning. Letter knowledge, knowing letter names and the sounds they represent also helps with decoding. Phonological awareness or hearing the sounds that make up the smaller, the hearing and playing with the sounds that make up words um, is a critically important component to decoding. In fact, um, adults' phonological awareness is a stronger indicator of the ability to learn how to read than IQ is. The good thing about phonological awareness is for children for whom it is difficult, it can be taught, assuming that they're um, typically developing and don't have like auditory discrimination, you know, issues or something like that. So phonological awareness is one of the most important um, early literacy components. So being able to read is just part of the story. Reading is understanding the meaning of the words. So take, for example, here we see Leah, who is hippo when she roves with her mom. We could guess, guessing is a strategy, but we don't know what hippo and rove mean because she's hippo when she roves with her mom here as well. So unless we know what those words are, we're not going to be able to understand the sentence. For example, I could decode um, significant parts of a book, say on physics, but I don't have the vocabulary or the background knowledge to be able to understand the words in the book. So therefore, while I could read it, I would not understand the meaning. So, and these are the skills that lend themselves to comprehension, knowing what words mean or vocabulary and background knowledge which is understanding the meaning of printed language and it is acquired through inst direct instruction you're being taught or through life experience that you know, um, for example, um, that you put your socks on before your shoes or you, things like that, that, you, that children, information children acquire by living. And fluency is, is um, something I didn't understand initially. It's the ability to read text accurately, quickly, and with expression, and is called the bridge between word recognition and comprehension. So if you've ever been in this, a situation where children were asked to read aloud, and you notice that there's a child who's not a smooth or fluent reader, it's because the child's having to stop to decode as they go. Okay, so if you don't, if you can't read a word easily and readily, you have to stop and figure it out. So your, your reading is choppy and it's hard for the reader to remember everything that they've read before because they're so busy decoding why fluency is so important. Now, since Every Child Ready to Read came out 10 years ago, version two came out 10 years ago. So there has been some new research that points to some other um, traits or characteristics or even attitudes that are important for children to be able to learn how to read. This is, um, first one is executive function. Executive function and self-regulation skills are the mental processes that enable us to plan, um, 
to focus our attention, to remember instructions, to um, avoid distractions, and to juggle multiple tasks um, successfully. Think of like an air traffic controller who has to keep track of where all the planes are going and figure out who's coming first, who's second, and all those kinds of things. It's comprised of working memory, the ability to hold information in our minds and use it. Like when, and we help children develop that, you know, with memory games and things like that. Inhibitory control is being able to resist temptations and distractions and to actually stop and think before doing something. I first learned about this with a very famous marshmallow experiment. If you haven't seen or watched the marshmallow experiment, you can see it on, on YouTube. It's so, it's so wonderful. Um, a researcher put children, young children in a room and said, okay, if you don't eat these and within a certain period of time, when I ring the bell, you're going to get many more if you can just wait. And so I, this to me looks like a, a, one of the children that, that might've waited till the bell rang and got more. And what they discovered over time was that the children who waited, who used um, their executive function and inhibitory control were more successful down the road. They were able to, um, to, to control their, their impulse to go ahead and eat the marshmallows. And the last thing is cognitive flexibility or the capacity to switch gears and adjust to changing demands and to be able to look at things from a different perspective or point of view. So lots of books that we have um, help children with that. So of course, executive function is all over story time. Um, children, when babies, when we play peekaboo with them, they have to remember, you know, if they're the ones that are hiding, when is it their turn to take it off? They have to exercise self-control when it's trot, trot to Boston, trot, trot to Lynn. Look out, baby, you might fall. And for them to hold on to the, you might, and not give the giggles and all the laughs until you say in, that is some, that self-control. How about the self-control or the cognitive flexibility, the memory and all those things when you go through, you've handed out your shakers and now you're going to pick them all up. What kind of um, things are children having to deal with with that? Being able to see things from a different point of view, like from when we share a book that is a story about another child's life. And I hear you all had the great pleasure of spending time with Jim Gill. His songs like... Um, I can't wait to can't wait to celebrate and jumping and counting. I use them in story time a lot, in part because the kids get to get up and move around, but it's got that way and then the action. And it's you've seen some of the kids. I mean, they can barely contain themselves without jumping ahead and doing what they know is coming next. He's a master at using child development strategies um, in his music. Another attribute that they've discovered is really helpful is what's called a growth mindset. So this is um, our belief that um, learning and improvement, that working hard gives us results and that we have an attitude of, yes, you know, I can do this. I can, I can achieve my goal. I can acquire this skill. I mean, if, if you were to say to uh, any highly skilled musician, athlete or writer or whatever, you know, when people say things like, oh, you know, you have such natural talent, you know, what they really have is stick to itiveness. Even with some talent, you're not going to get very far if you don't work really hard and trying to improve your skill. So we don't encourage, we don't want to encourage a fixed mindset, which is the belief that, you know, I, you know what, whatever, I'm just born like I can't, I'm just not good at this. And so I'm not going to try. That's not what, you know, we want to encourage effort instead of saying, oh, wow, you know, you must be so smart. You did, you did this. It, it's saying things more like, wow, oh, you must have worked really hard to be able to do this so well. That's the kind of thing that in the early childhood community um, they're working on. Um, and I like the phrase, you know, children aren't born smart. They're made smart, you know, through adult um participation and support. So some research done by um, Dr. Scott Paris pointed out that there are 
that not all skills are equal, okay? Decoding skills are good um, really up to about the third grade. And after that, it's all about comprehension. And these are called constrained skills because see, they're finite. Unconstrained skills are the ones we use for the rest of our lives as we are lifelong learners, constantly learning things and striving to do better. Um, you might have heard the expression, you learn to read up through grade three, and then you read to learn. This is basically what this is um, showing. So we know that one of um, the best ways to help children get ready to read, in fact, it's touted as the best way to help children get ready to read is by reading with them. So, and how do we read with children? Well, there are lots of different ways of doing this. Um, Dr. John Hutton, <clears throat> developed this um, methodology called share step and it's um, a, way, a way to read with babies. I really like it um, because it's um, simple and he's written this really charming book um, that would be a great book to hand out if you have money for like summer reading program for parents or like a program if you ever invited to do an outreach program for new parents or something like that. This would be an, a wonderful gift um, to give them. And this is his share step methodology of reading books with baby. He recommends that, and this is actually in the book, um, that you snuggle up with the baby. And you can see the illustrations um, do all this. Let the baby hold the book. This print awareness, right? This is children get to know about books by holding them. Show love and affection when you're reading with the baby respond to the baby's cues. And then that's where the step comes in. Stretch the words out, right? We saw that with speaking parentese. Talk, that's the serve and return, all right? Explore, talk about all the things on the page and use funny voices and all those things to keep the child's attention. And we need to have patience because sometimes things don't go as we had hoped. And above all, enjoy. Such an important message for us when we're sharing information with adults about sharing books with their own children, that if it's not fun, they need to stop. That um, to, to wait for a time that's more conducive, where the child is more able um, to um, enjoy the reading with the adults. And I think these are really interesting questions that um, he posed in the workshop that I was able to attend through the Dollywood Foundation, um, how we can help adults deal with some of the questions that they might have about how do I read right with a baby. Some adults might feel that um, the baby's not interested, that um, the baby's not a reader. Well, of course, the baby's not a reader. The baby can't read. Baby's more interested in TV. How could we approach these kinds of comments in our interactions with them? And how can we help adults with their own feelings of um, not being confident readers, um, explaining um, that they, they can, you know, they don't have to read the words on the page, especially if the child's restless, they can just read or talk about the pictures. We can share wordless books. We can share words, uh, books that have very, very few words or words that probably most adults know, like, you know, like, no, David, you know, books like that, that, that they could be reading with their children. Um, in order, because we always want to approach um, our interactions with adults from, from a strength-based approach, which is our belief that they are doing the best they can um, and they love their children and want what's best for them. And to be kind and supportive, of course. So now we're gonna take a look at dialogic reading. So this is um, a method of sharing books with children that um, has a long and a very long history of deep research base of moving the, the needle on children's um, acquiring vocabulary. It's meant to be done with children who have at least 50 words. So this is not something um, to be done with a baby because the baby um, can't talk. So um, this is switching, reading a book on its head. We want the child to become the storyteller while the adult is 
the one who's listening. And the way we do that is by using a particular strategy called PEER. Um, it is the, the fundamental one that, that most researchers advocate. It's just a short interaction with a book between an adult and a child. And of course, PEER is an acronym. Um, what I like about, well, I like a lot of things about dialogic reading, but one of the things in particular is that for adults who are not accustomed to reading with their children, who don't have confidence, as noted in the last few slides, dialogic reading can be taught. Um, you all um, should have the handout on dialogic reading, having a conversation about the pictures in a book. Um, and this can be you know, used as a handout if you have the opportunity to talk to a parent group. What I have done when I've been a presenter at the local conference, um, the, the local um, chapter of the National Association for the Education of Young Children, um, I've done a workshop on dialogic reading and I have a book that I can give the care providers that they practice dialogic reading with and then they, they can take that book home to their center or to their um, childcare home, wherever it is that they are working. And I'm basing my dialogic reading on um, this book from Dolly Parton's Imagination Library um, by Rachel Isadora. I just want to say good night. So peer, prompt, evaluate, expand, <clears throat> and repeat. And I'm gonna show you how it works. So first you're going to prompt a child to say something, the child that you're with, um, about the picture by asking a question. Oh, by the way, we've already read the book, okay? So the child um, is familiar with the storyline, so we're actually asking the child to remember what's happened um, in the book. So these are, these are fair questions that the child um, should be able, um, might be able to answer. So uh, with children that don't have too many words, you start out by, some, by labeling but I'm going to do this um, model for you as if it were a child who's older, who has more words than just um, the 50 words. So I could say, for example, how do you think Lala feels? I'm asking the child. She says, sleepy. That's right, she's sleepy. She's exhausted. She's had such a long day. She's exhausted from telling everybody good night. How do you think she feels? And then you're hoping the child will chime in with exhausted. And if not, you can go ahead and repeat it. You can ask the child, can you say exhausted? Right, that means she's really, really tired. So this is, Hopefully, you know, this is difficult to do because I'm doing it myself. If it were a child, she'd, we'd probably be able to have a whole conversation around this. Um, but that's basically how the fundamental um, part of, the, of peer works. But then um, the second part is what's called follow the crowd. And that's when we ask um, completion questions. Um, because we've read the book, I can ask questions about what's going on here. So I could say, for example, so she, who is Lala saying good night to here? She's saying good night. And I'm waiting for the child to say mama. And if she's not getting it, I could say good night. And then hopefully the child will say mama. That's right. I could say then she's saying good night to her mama. Who else did she say good night to? And that's a recall question. Who else did she say good night to? Because in this book, she says good night to, I mean, a multitude of different um, creatures, um, the cat, the goat, um, her father, um, a monkey, the ants, the chickens. I mean, she just says good night to everybody. And clearly, um, this is not a sleepy child. So recall questions when you're asking about what happened in the book. And then next, of course, are our open-ended questions that cannot be answered by yes or no, because anything that can be answered by yes or no is a conversation stopper. There's nowhere to go from there. 
So you can say, tell me what's happening here. I wonder what's going on. Wow. I wonder why the moonlight is so bright. Oh my gosh. I see the moon and the moon sees me. Remembering back to our rich language, our, our play talk, and the fact that we could do one little piggy. There's so many opportunities for talking with children about books when we use the books this way. And of course, those all important. What is that, the labeling? Why do you think so? So this kind of question, um, why do you think so? Asking children to think about what they're thinking is very high level. I think we're the only, I think we're the only creatures that think about thinking. So when you ask them to explain themselves, it really can open up a lot, um, give us an opportunity to see how their brains operate. And then some more specific questions. When did that happen? Where is she? Things like that. Um, you know, pick your pick whatever you want to do. Obviously, you're not asking all these questions. These are just examples of the kinds of questions that can be asked. Distancing questions are also is decontextualized language. It's talking about things that are not in the here or now, where the child has to remember something from their own experiences. So for example, I could say, Lala read Goodnight Moon um, before she went to sleep. Do you remember what we read last night before bedtime? And you could give hints. It was some, about some big furry animals that, you know, slept in a cave or, and that's right, we read Shh, Bear Sleeping. That was our book. So these are the kinds of questions that can um, open up discussion with children. Now, you know, you can, some people do dialogic reading and story time. If you go, for example, to a preschool classroom and you're able to teach the, um, the teachers how to do this, you can do small group book sharing. You can ask some open-ended questions during story time, but of course we need to remember what, you know, what we're opening the door to. A lot, of, a lot of comments, a lot of me, 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 depending on the age of the kids. This is a really good strategy um, for small groups, for breaking up into small groups and for and teaching care providers parent and parents um, some interesting ways of sharing books. So how do you pick a book um, for dialogic reading? Well, um, do you choose a good book for dialogic reading or a book that's good for dialogic reading? I mean, just because it's a good book, in other words, doesn't mean it's good for dialogic reading, okay? Um, because we want a book that where the illustrations help tell the story because the child can't read and we're asking the child to recall the story. We want to have a book that has interesting characters with child appeal. There has to be something to talk about, right? Some kind of situation requiring thought or problem solving. Now, I just wanted to say goodnight didn't have a big problem, but it did require thought to think about why is she saying, why is she taking so long to go to bed? And there's lots of things to talk about in the story. Chance to expand vocabulary. We're gonna see a lot more about, about using synonyms and all the different ways we can expand children's vocabulary next time we meet up when we specifically look at vocabulary acquisition. Opportunities for playing with words or rhymes, lots of opportunities. I, you can sing a song, you could do um, finger plays, you know, taking your lead from the book. Print big enough so that you can point to the words occasionally. Well, yes, because that is print awareness. That's one of the skills that um, we use when we share books with children. And it's gotta be a book you like. I almost feel silly saying that because why would we use a book we don't like, right? I mean, it's like, it's like you know, story time 101, use a book you like. So, um, so what I'd like to do now is we're going to break up into groups and, um, practice dialogic reading. I know it might seem like, oh, really, this is so easy. But every time I've tried to do this, I discover just how not easy it is. Um, because sometimes, you know, I just think like, I say things like, what color is it? So try not to ask what color it is. Um, how many are there? 
again, these are the two easiest things that we can ask. Since you're using books that you picked and that are familiar with you, I mean, familiar to you, try to aim for like a higher level of discourse with the child. Think of it as being a slightly older preschooler who has some enough words to be able to become the storyteller. So when you pair up, one of you is the child, the other is the adult. That for the child, I mean, don't be too extreme in your ability to talk, you know, but be somewhat chatty and, and help out the questioner so that the, the questioner can, um, can, lead, can um, take some hints off of what you're saying. But remember, we want the child to be the storyteller. And so um, Kathy's going to break um, you up into groups and we'll come back in about um, probably about... Um, I don't know, 12 minutes or something, 15 minutes, so that we can see how it went. Yeah, okay. and I'm going to do um, some groups of three here, um, just because we've got a few people that are messaging me <laughs> individually about some kinks and whatnot. So I'm going to try to get you into your rooms. If you are um, alone, hang out there for a minute, and I will try to move you into another room. All right. All right, we're going to send you out. Five minutes, Pam? Pam? Um, uh, maybe, I, I don't think five is long enough. Okay. Yeah, let's try for 10. 10, okay. Yeah. And if, right. if you're done, come back in, and if everyone's done, then we can go ahead, okay? Sounds good. All right. So please go ahead and head out to your rooms so that people aren't alone in theirs. Okay, I'm gonna pause. So I should All right, guys. And then, because we're just gonna talk. Yeah, welcome back. Welcome back. Um, sorry, a few of you got left alone for a few seconds. Hopefully, we you had some good conversations, some good interactions. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Pamela. Okay, so um, I'm I'm always interested to hear how this experience went. Was were there any was there anything a little surprising or what did you notice in doing this? If you don't mind sharing your thoughts on dialogic reading. Anybody? I think for me, um, admittedly, I brought a book. I do the baby story time. Mm -hmm. um, so I brought a book for babies, which is not the best, but I did find increasingly, like I saw in the picture, like, oh, like they had, they had some bikes. Like I could ask things like, what are they about to do? You know? Uh, and I found the pictures were more rich than I was expecting for, mm -hmm. you know, a baby book. <laughs> I, uh, illustrators and authors have learned a lot. I think, oh, I think uh, my sense is a lot of them are keeping up with a lot of the research and are you know, putting images in that lend themselves to discussion. Um, that, that's, that's a really good, a good point. Anyone else have anything? Did anyone? Okay, yeah. Yeah, um, I noticed that I actually had a hard time asking questions about the pictures because I brought in a picture book, which like the words were saying one thing and the pictures are basically showing another. Oh. <laughs> so it's like trying to find the contradictions and all that. Uh, I read uh, this one here, which has got some really cool, really wonderful illustrations. And it's, and it's like, there's so much, there's a lot to notice, but it's like trying to form them into open ending questions. It's like, it's a little nerve wracking, but I think with more practice, uh, I can certainly uh, ask more of the appropriate questions that you be, need to ask when interacting with a kid, a kid with this kind of reading. Yeah, and the, the other thing is some books are just, well, we're gonna see this a lot when we get together next week. Some books really lend themselves to one thing or another. Um, you can do all the things with most books, but you know maybe it's just not the, 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 the most logical book to use for something like dialogic reading. It'd be really great for narrative skills or vocabulary or something else. I mean, that's, that's fair that not all books are, are are as, as easy or lend themselves to it as readily as others, for sure. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Anybody else? Of course, some questions just prompt them to ask more questions and that 
ends up spiraling as well, too. So um, that continues the conversation, mm -hmm. just from their point of view. And, you know, we know that children really like to be spoken to and they like to have the opportunity to talk to, to grownups. Um, and a lot of children don't have that many opportunities to talk to somebody else. Um, and I think dialogic reading is such a great, op is such a wonderful opportunity for, for us to get to know them a little bit individually. Um, or if you have like time, like after story time, if you don't have to rush and clean everything up, you know, maybe you're in the story time room, that you could take a little bit of time and take your story time book and then take a few minutes and go back through it with one, one of the children or a couple of the children who's, you know, maybe the parents are lingering because they're chatting, you know, or what have you, um, and give kids the opportunity to talk with you. Um, it can mean a lot. It means a lot to them. And it can be great for us to actually get to know some children a little bit better than we might otherwise. And did anyone find it um, difficult or anything interesting? Pamela, Erin had a, her hand up too. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Oh, I'm not on that page. Go ahead. <laughs> I know you probably couldn't see me. So I'm just trying to confirm or to clarify when you're doing dialogical reading, are you wanting to like cut the text out of the page completely for maybe that first time through and just let the kids talk about what is happening in the book? Or do you want to, um, find out what they think is going to happen and then go ahead and read the dialogue the text for that page because i've done both ways you know where you ask them and then you do it that and you read it right away or you go the whole way through the book with predictive reading so the predictive reading um strategy is called picture walk and that is um a big part of every child ready to read too um that's what um i was going to talk about about next, or, you know, if we if we have time, the thing about the, the picture walk is it's really much more so for the older child. A picture walk is is when you do exactly what Aaron said. You don't read the book to the child first. You get <clears throat> well. I'll just show you how it works now. You take your book and you say, um, you know, what do you think this is about? And because a lot of kids are familiar with Llama Llama, they're going to probably tell you it's about, you know, Llama Llama or what have you. And then when you go through doing a picture, picture walk, you, what you're doing is asking them the same kinds of questions using the peer method and crowd and all that, but you're asking them to make predictions about what's going on in the book, okay, um, without reading the text. So this is good for children who are older, but dialogic reading can be done with a child who knows like 50 words because you're, you're developing um, vocabulary that way. So this is to help, um, to help us know what words children know so that we can see their ability to make predictions. We can see um, how good they are at analyzing characters. You know, why is Llama Llama doing this? How does Llama Llama feel? Um, and they can, those are the kinds of questions we can ask. But again, they're, they're telling the story, which is great, but um, it's not, I, I think it's a little bit harder to teach because it's, it's more, it feels like more general to me, whereas the dialogic reading has very specific things that you can do. Um, and also, I think there's a larger research base supporting dialogic reading versus <clears throat> picture book walk. And the fact that this is for older children <clears throat> makes me um, not use it as often because I think the dialogic reading is um, more more appropriate for is appropriate for larger age groups. So I was thinking of doing, you know, the um, last stop on Market Street as a picture walk. And then when I was going through it, I realized there's so much in the middle when he's on the when um, 
when CJ's on the bus and he hears the music and he's kind of like floating with the music, that would be really hard for a child to be able to, to explain. So that's when I realized this probably is not a great book for, um, for a picture walk because it's, it's really complex. It's a beautiful book. It's a wonderful book. And I would absolutely use it in a story time, but not necessarily for this, which kind of drives home the point that not all books are really good for all, all occasions, although um, we, can, we can just find you know, where the books fit in. So um, Aaron, I hope that answered your question. The difference between dialogic and picture walk is um, it's pretty it, it's pretty big. Although picture walk, they say go ahead and use the strategies for dialogic reading, but you're not doing prediction um, because you haven't. In dialogic reading, you're not doing predictions because they've already read the book. Okay. Right. So big yeah. Thing. So just to clarify, because in the chat, Aaron, I think it's kind of the opposite of that comment. It, so um, dialogic reading, you read the book, mm -hmm. you use the text, and yep. then you discuss. Yeah. There's a picture book mm -hmm. walk. A picture book walk, the child tells the story with the pictures. And, there, and then you can read, then you read the book and you ask a child if what they predicted is what actually happened. Okay, but dialogic reading, remember we have recall questions. We're asking them what happened. Because we part of um, dialogic reading is helping them develop what we call narrative skills, which is um, the ability to tell and retell stories, and that's that's an, one of the early literacy skills that children need, and also that to learn that um, books have a beginning, a middle, and an end, and you learn that by by recalling stories and talking about um, how the story moved ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So it's just about time to end. Um, I have really enjoyed our time um, together today. And I hope I'll see many of you, if not all of you next week when we get together, when we really dive into um, early literacy and how it is all over the story times that you are already doing. So we're gonna look at the early literacy components in some depth. And then you are going to please bring an outline for a story time so that you can see which particular skill you're gonna to want to play around with as we see how we, we pull out the early literacy component and how we're going to be explaining that to the adults, which will actually literally work on more the third time we're together. So next week is early literacy components and your story time. Um, you did get a handout on, um, the like basics of early literacy, it's a multi-page handout. If you'd like to read that, um, go ahead. Don't feel, you know, this isn't homework. It's okay if you don't read it. Um, but if you do, you'll 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 feel super smart because you because you um you have that growth mindset, you know, you're like, if I work at this harder, I'm gonna be able to do it. Um, but anyway, we'll be covering all of that um, when we get together next time. So again, thank you so much for your time and attention. I really do appreciate it. Um, and I hope you have a good rest of the week and weekend. And until till we meet again, everybody, I wish you well. Take care. Thank you, Pamela. Oh, Thank pleasure. you, everyone. We will see you back here next week. Same link, same time. Talk to you then. <laughs>